on World News Tonight. More allegations. Tensions spill over between the East and the West with new accusations on the origins of COVID. Rights talks. The UN Human Rights Council gathers at its 52nd session with contentious debates on the table. A trade truce. Britain and the EU seal the deal to fix the Northern Ireland trade spat. And winter in style. Milan is bathed in the freshest styles and colours with Armani's latest collection. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening to all our viewers and we have a series of updates lined up tonight. Now, just as it could be seen that global relations could not fall any lower, the U.S. has continued to accuse China in internationally creating and spreading the SARS-CoV-19 virus made in the lab in Wuhan. An already inflamed relationship between US and China is being exacerbated by two fresh controversies, one over the exact origins of COVID-19 and the other stemming from stern US warnings that China must not arm Russia in its war in Ukraine. The new disagreements are so fraught that the recent unprecedented diplomatic showdown over the suspected Chinese spy balloon that floated across the continental United States is not even the most recent or intense cause to strife. This trio of confrontations along with rising tensions between US and Chinese forces in Asia and escalating standoffs over Taiwan are dramatizing a long building and once theoretical superpower rivalry that is suddenly a daily reality. A day after U.S. media reported a federal agency had found the pandemic probably started from the laboratory leak in Wuhan, the U.S. envoy to China has called on the country to be more honest about the origins of the COVID-19 virus. Following reports that the U.S. Energy Department concluded that the COVID-19 pandemic likely arose from a leak at a Chinese laboratory, the U.S. ambassador to China, Nicholas Burns, on Monday said Beijing needed to be more honest about the origins of the deadly virus. If we're going to do something to strengthen the World Health Organization, then we're going to have to push China to be more active in it and to, of course, be more honest about what happened three years ago in Wuhan with the origin of the, of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Those words spoken by video link at a U.S. Chamber of Commerce event come after the Wall Street Journal reported that the Department of Energy made what it described as a low confidence judgment in a classified intelligence report that COVID-19 likely arose from a Chinese lab. China flatly denies that assessment. Asked to comment on the report, China's foreign ministry referred to a WHO China report that pointed to a natural origin, likely from bats rather than a lab leak. White House National Security spokesman John Kirby on Monday faced questions about the reports. And I would add that one of the things the president did was he, he's the one who tasked the national labs, which were poured up through the Department of Energy, to study this as well. So it wasn't just an effort that was confined to the intelligence community. That work is still ongoing. The Energy Department did not respond to a request for comment. Meanwhile, the UN Human Rights Council has gathered to discuss rights violations around the world, including those linked to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and alleged genocide in China. On Monday, the 52nd regular session of the United Nations Human Rights Council began. The meeting of the 47-member council, which runs until April 4th, is expected to strengthen scrutiny of Moscow's alleged war crimes and raise China's treatment of Muslim Uyghurs. In one of the first speeches delivered to open the meeting, UN High Commissioner Volker Türk warned that human rights gains are in danger of being nullified, referring to atrocities reported out of Ukraine as an example of oppression. During the meeting, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the Russian invasion of Ukraine had triggered massive rights violations and that in addition to terrible suffering caused by repeated shellings of Ukrainian cities and key infrastructure, dozens of cases of conflict-related sexual violence against men, women and girls had been documented in Ukraine in the last year. The Russian invasion of the Ukraine has triggered the most massive violations of human rights we are living today. It has unleashed widespread deaths, destruction and displacement. Member states are also watching how the UN High Commissioner will refer to China as Beijing is being accused of genocide against Uyghurs, an ethnic minority in the country, including the alleged mass use of forced labor in internment camps. China has vigorously denied the allegations. 
Meanwhile, South Korea's National Human Rights Commission reviewed recommendations from the UN body and issued a statement on Monday urging the government to enact a comprehensive law banning discrimination and the abolishment of the death penalty. The UN also recommended that South Korea promote women's rights, protect the rights of groups vulnerable to climate change, and prevent rights abuses arising from advancements in artificial intelligence and information technology. Seoul is required to notify the UN body of its decision to accept or reject the recommendations before the council convenes an organizational meeting in June. And on a more promising note, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak struck a deal with the European Union on post-Brexit trade rules for Northern Ireland, saying that it would pave the way for a new chapter in London's relationship with the bloc. Goods shipped here in Holyhead in Wales have, since Brexit, had heavy EU paperwork ahead, even though the lorries are heading to Northern Ireland part of the UK. That's been one of the central problems with Brexit's Northern Ireland protocol, which London and Brussels now say has been resolved. The EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak hailed what's called the Windsor Framework as a new chapter in EU-UK ties. Today's agreement delivers smooth-flowing trade within the whole United Kingdom, protects Northern Ireland's place in our union and safeguards sovereignty for the people of Northern Ireland. The new Windsor framework respects and protects our respective markets and our respective legitimate interests. And most importantly, it protects the very hard-earned peace gains of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. The deal follows more than a year of tense talks over the Northern Ireland Protocol, which has unsettled the province 25 years after the Good Friday Agreement ended three decades of conflict. Thousands of pages of EU law scrapped and with a The Windsor framework on Northern Ireland introduces a new green lane for, for goods staying within the UK. Ireland. It means UK approved food and medicine are fully available and ensures future VAT changes made for the rest of the UK apply now to Northern Ireland as well. It also limits oversight by the EU's European Court of Justice of rules concerning Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Assembly will be allowed to prevent application of new EU laws. I welcome the fact that a deal has Sinn Féin, which won elections in the province last year, welcomed the deal and called for the Democratic Unionists to end their boycott of power sharing. The DUP says it will see whether the deal meets its tests, including just what role the European Court of Justice will have. And how does that match our seven tests? Can I congratulate the negotiators on This is not yet a done deal. UK MPs will vote on the new arrangements for the province, which has been without a devolved government since last February. With the conflict in Ukraine not seeming to slow, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen paid a surprise visit to Kyiv to reaffirm U.S. support for Ukraine in its struggle against Russia's invasion and to promote U.S. economic aid that is bolstering Ukraine's war efforts. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen swept into Kyiv on Monday in a surprise visit to reaffirm U.S. support for Ukraine as it fights Russia's invasion highlighting U.S. economic aid that is bolstering Ukraine's war effort. Yellen met with President Volodymyr Zelensky and Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmihal. Shmihal said the two discussed further U.S. sanctions on Russia, as well as confiscating frozen Russian assets. Yellen's visit comes a week after U.S. President Joe Biden staged his own unannounced trip to Kyiv and promised $500 million in additional military aid for Ukraine and new sanctions on Russia announced days later, including effectively banning U.S. imports of Russian aluminum. Yellen visited Kyiv on her way back to Washington from a G20 finance leaders meeting in India, where she urged counterparts to boost economic aid to Ukraine and insisted that G20 ministers issue a strong condemnation of Russia's invasion. Now, along with Ukraine, Pakistan is also facing some heat as police in Pakistan's northwest region bordering Afghanistan provided a thin line of defense against Islamic insurgents trying to attack the country's military. But while the number of police fatalities mount resources to back them up are hard to come by. This police officer wielding an anti-aircraft gun at an outpost in Pakistan is not actually on the lookout for aircraft. He's on alert for Islamist militant guerrillas 
who've launched an unprecedented spate of bloody attacks against the force, the Khyber Pathankhwa Provincial Police, on the northwest border with Afghanistan. In late January, a Peshawar mosque bombing killed over 80 police personnel, the deadliest single attack on the force to date. Jamil Shah, an officer with the police station controlling the outpost, says militants have been attacking almost daily. His outpost is one of dozens that make up a so-called thin line of defense against militants who hide out in the border region. It's a hotbed for fighters of the Pakistani Taliban, or TTP, an umbrella organization of hardline Sunni Islamist groups. Its stated aim is to impose Islamic religious law in Pakistan. Shah says the province's police force has fought Islamist militants for years, but have never been their sole focus as they are today. 119 police were killed in Khyber Pathankhwa last year. It's an escalation from 21 dead in 2020, then 54 in 2021. So far this year, 102 have already been killed. A TTP spokesman told its main target is in fact Pakistan's military, saying, quote, the police have been told many times not to obstruct our way, and instead of paying heed to this, the police have started martyring our comrades. This is why we're targeting them. Officers say they're up for the fight, but lament the lack of resources. <laughs> Staffing is a key one. At an academy in the region, fresh police graduates are training up with a six-month anti-militant operation crash course. With skills like rappelling from buildings and launching rocket-propelled grenades, they'll help with the police shortage one day, but other problems remain. Meanwhile, the militants are using US-made rifles, surveillance drones and thermal goggles from stocks left by Western forces that exited Afghanistan in 2021. Pakistan has been in a financial tailspin for over a year, trying to slash spending and avoid default. The lack of resources is deeply personal for these police staffers, gathered at the site of the Peshawar mosque blast to honor their lost comrades. The imam is himself a police employee who lost his brother in the attack. There's little he can do but pray for the success of the force. We're going into a short commercial break now. We'll be back soon with mobile news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, Fox Corp chairman Rupert Murdoch acknowledged under oath that some Fox hosts endorsed the nation that the 2020 U.S. presidential election was stolen. Murdoch's acknowledgement is including in a filing from Dominion Voting Systems, part of the voting technology firm's $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox News and parent company Fox Corp over Fox, Fox's coverage of the 2020 presidential election. Court records unsealed Monday showed that Fox Corporation Chairman Rupert Murdoch acknowledged under oath that some Fox News hosts endorsed false claims that the 2020 U.S. presidential election was stolen from former President Donald Trump. The filing from Dominion Voting Systems is part of the voting technology firm's $1.6 billion defamation lawsuit against Fox News and its parent company over the cable news giant's coverage of the 2020 presidential election, a case that's headed to trial in April. Documents in the case show Murdoch and other Fox executives believed Joe Biden fairly beat Donald Trump and that the results were not in doubt. Dominion has argued that internal communications and depositions by Fox personnel prove the network knowingly spread falsehoods about Trump's loss in order to boost ratings. Fox has argued that its coverage of claims by Trump's lawyers were protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Asked by a Dominion lawyer if some of Fox commentators had endorsed the idea that the 2020 election was stolen, Murdoch responded, yes, they endorsed, according to the filing. In a statement Monday, a Fox spokesperson said Dominion's view of the defamation law would prevent journalists from basic reporting, accusing Dominion of smearing Fox for covering Trump's allegations. Dominion's filing included emails and statements by Rupert Murdoch and other top Fox executives saying the claims made about Dominion on air were false. Part of the voting machine company's effort to prove the network either knew the statements it aired were false or recklessly disregarded their accuracy. 
the standard of actual malice public figures must prove to win a defamation case. A grim update comes to us now as Turkey is still trying to recover from the devastating earthquakes that killed tens of thousands of people. Making matters worse, the country saw a new magnitude 5.6 quake shake the country. Yet another earthquake slammed Turkey on Monday. This time, a magnitude 5.6 earthquake struck the southeastern region of the country, killing one and injuring over a hundred others. Authorities say Yesteyurt in Malatya province was the epicenter of the latest quake, an area that has already experienced four earthquakes in the past three weeks, as well as over 10,000 aftershocks. Speaking to local media, Yesteyurt's mayor Mehmet Sinar said a number of buildings in the town collapsed, including a four-story building where two people, a father and daughter, were trapped inside. The latest quake comes at a time when the country is still trying to recover from the massive earthquakes on February 6th, which killed tens of thousands of people. Meanwhile, according to a World Bank disaster assessment report released Monday, the cost of earthquake damage in Turkey is estimated to exceed 34 billion U.S. dollars. And that figure is only based on the damage done by the two earthquakes on February 6th. That figure is equivalent to 4 percent of Turkey's 2021 GDP. However, the World Bank assesses that recovery and reconstruction costs will be even bigger, estimating a figure twice that of the cost of damage. Syria's World Bank disaster assessment report was conducted separately and is set to be released on Tuesday. Japanese advertising giant Dentsu Group and five other companies have been indicted over alleged bid rigging of contracts for the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. It comes after regulators filed criminal complaints against the firms and seven unnamed individuals. The announcement follows months of investigation into alleged corruption in the planning and sponsorship of Olympics and Paralympics events. Tokyo-based Dentsu is Japan's biggest advertising agency. Dentsu said in a statement that it takes the situation seriously and offers its sincere apologies to its business partners, shareholders and all other relevant parties for any inconvenience or concern this may cause. The company added that the former employee of the group was now working for one of its subsidiaries and had indicted for an alleged violation of Anti-Monopoly Act in connection to the bidding for the test events of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Another of the indicted firms, Hakuhodo D.Y. Holdings, said an employee of its subsidiary, Hakuhodo D.Y. Media Partners, had been indicted by the Tokyo District Public Prosecutor's Office based on charges brought by the Commission. The announcement came after the Japan Fair Trade Commission filed complaints against Dansu, Hakuhodo D.Y. Holdings and four other advertising agencies. The death toll from the migrant boat disaster off the coast of Calabria climbed to over 100, where rescuers recovered the bodies of three more people. Rescuers trolling the Mediterranean recovered more bodies on Monday, a day after a wooden sailboat carrying migrants to Europe shipwrecked off of Italy's southern coast. Debris lined the beach after the vessel crashed into rocks in stormy weather on Sunday, leaving scores dead including more than a dozen children. Pakistan's prime minister said more than two dozen Pakistanis were believed to have been among the boat's passengers. Rescuers said many Afghanis and some Iranians had also been aboard. Local authorities said 80 people survived the shipwreck, but as many as 200 may have been aboard the vessel when it left from Turkey, suggesting many more passengers are missing. Locals left flowers and candles on metal railings outside a sports hall where dozens of coffins were laid out ahead of an eventual funeral. The shipwreck has reignited a debate on migration in Europe and Italy, where the recently elected right-wing government's tough new laws for migrant rescue charities have drawn criticism from the United Nations and others. The UN Missing Migrants Project has registered more than 20,000 deaths and disappearances in the Mediterranean since 2014, including more than 220 just this year, making it the most dangerous migrant route in the world. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's look here around the world in a minute.
Lionel Messi was named FIFA Player of the Year 2022 as Argentina scooped all major men's awards after winning a vintage World Cup final last December. One of Southeast Asia's largest and longest-running military exercises kicked off in Eastern Thailand, resuming full-scale operations after a two-year hiatus due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A huge dust storm hit northwest Texas in the United States, blanketing the skies in an orange haze and promoting authorities to issue a weather advisory on lower visibility. Hong Kong will drop its COVID-19 mask mandate in a move aimed at luring back visitors and businesses and restoring normal life more than three years after stringent rules were first imposed in the financial hub. Canada blocked the Chinese-owned social media app TikTok from government-issued devices, saying its presence is at an unacceptable level of risk to privacy and security. Canada also moved to block federal employees from downloading the application in future. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories that we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with visuals of world-class models donning silky pyjama-like shirts and trousers, as well as dresses at Armani's Milan Fashion Week show, as a veteran Italian designer presented the Winter 2023 collection for his main line. Thank you for watching. Stay safe and have a good night.